Hello and welcome to Neuro Quick Check. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. In this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about how to do that quick check of a neuro assessment on your patient. If you need to do a quick neuro assessment on your patient without going through that full neuro check or that full neuro assessment, I suggest that you start with using this five-step method. Starting out at the top, we notice that there is the change in behavior. So that's one of the first things that's going to change. Next, we have speech, then down to content of arousal, arousal, and then lastly, systolic blood pressure. As we go from the top to the bottom, we're going from our best neurologic function, the green part, down to the worst neurologic function, which is the red part there. So let's talk about each one of these in turn. A change in behavior, that's the first thing that's going to be changed. Unfortunately, though, it may be subtle and may be ignored. You may think that, well, this is just the patient having a bad day, or maybe this is the patient's personality, or maybe you're thinking that, well, the patient has been in the hospital for a while, they're getting kind of short because they are tired of being here. We also need to rule out any metabolic causes for that change in behavior, such as maybe a high blood glucose level. The next step down is the speech. Speech requires an awful lot of different parts of the brain to function. First of all, we need to have the thought being processed in the frontal lobe. We're changing that thought into words in the parietal lobe, communicating the thought into the temporal lobe. We have Broca's area there that is responsible for communication. That'll help with the motor response now that we need from the lungs, the vocal cords in the mouth, in order to be able to speak that word. Assessing the cranial nerves is done from that motor response of the lungs of vocal cords in the mouth. So we get a little bit of the cranial nerve response at the same time. The next level down is content of arousability. This is the orientation part. Now, in most cases, what we ask people is about these three dimensions, person, place, and time. So we may ask them things like, you know, what is your name? Most people can get that right. And then where are they? Well, if you've ever woken up in a hospital, you may be a little bit confused about your surroundings, especially if you're also taking some medications that are going to change your perception. So when the person wakes up and says, the 80-year-old patient that wakes up and says, geez, I'm still in a nursing home, we may say, well, gee, they're not oriented to place. But in fact, they very well may be. It's not like our hospital rooms look so much different than the nursing home room. So the patient may think that they're still in the nursing home. So we want to really make sure that we're getting a good assessment here of the content of arousal, this piece we call orientation. And I'm calling it content of arousal because I want you to be thinking of it in a different way than just the simple orientation questions we normally ask. The third part is time. So we may ask the patient, what day of the week is it? Well, on many days, I'm sure that if somebody were to ask you, you may not know what day of the week it is or maybe even what the date is. Think about the last time you were on vacation and you had to think about, is today Tuesday or Wednesday? So time is going to be a difficult piece too uh, with some of our patients because they just may not be paying attention to it. And even the time of the day is difficult to be able to determine since there's lights on all the time and so on. So um, be careful about your assessment of these three pieces or dimensions of the content of arousal. We also want to make sure it's age appropriate and culturally aware. The next level down is arousal. We're looking for wakefulness here. This is assessing our reticular activating system. So we're looking at some of the lower portions of the brain, the brain stem, the cortex, and also hormonal control, such as cortisol, that is controlling the patient's wakefulness. Lastly, we're going to look at systolic blood pressure. If your patient is completely unconscious, you can still assess the systolic blood pressure to give you an, an idea of whether or not there are changes that are occurring in intracranial pressure.
As intracranial pressure changes, or as intracranial pressure increases, our systolic blood pressure will have to increase in order to be able to maintain cerebral perfusion. Cerebral perfusion pressure should be maintained at about 70 millimeters of mercury or greater. In order to figure out what the cerebral perfusion pressure is, we need to take the mean arterial pressure and subtract the intracranial pressure. In many cases, let's say your patient's got a normal blood pressure, 120 over 80, so their mean arterial pressure is probably somewhere around in the 90 range. We subtract our intracranial pressure from that, which should be fairly low, maybe five, for example. We'd end up with a cerebral perfusion pressure of 85. Okay, so that's greater than 70, and we would have a normal cerebral perfusion pressure. However, what if your patient is in shock, and your patient has a mean arterial pressure of 50, and maybe the patient also has a head injury from trauma, and has intracranial pressure of 20. Now you can see, 50 minus 20, now we're all the way down to 30. We do not have an adequate cerebral perfusion pressure. The body's response is going to be to try to increase systolic blood pressure in an attempt to maintain that cerebral perfusion pressure. If the patient is in shock, then chances are that we've already used up those compensatory mechanisms, but that is the component that's going to try to increase the systolic blood pressure. Well, why just systolic and not systolic and diastolic? Remember that there's baroreceptors throughout the body, not just in the brain, and those baroreceptors in the rest of the body are saying, hey, knock it off, we don't need all this blood pressure. And so what they're doing is they're actually causing vasodilation in the periphery, which maintains a lower diastolic pressure. So we'll end up with a wide pulse pressure as a result. There is a critical point with this component here. So we're seeing the systolic blood pressure going up. Now you see the heart rate's also going down. This is called Cushing's triad. And the heart rate is going down because of that parasympathetic stimulation from the peripheral system saying, hey, we've got too much sympathetic stimulation and they're trying to turn it off. So we're getting that vasodilation that is occurring and we're also getting a decrease in the heart rate. So the heart rate goes down, we get bradycardia, while at the same time we're getting systolic hypertension. We reach a critical point where these mechanisms are no longer working and then the patient decompensates and may die. So here again is our neural quick check. We're looking for that change in behavior first. That's one of your first signs. We really need to be in tune for that when there's a change in behavior. Oftentimes we may think that it's just the patient having a bad day, but you might want to look a little bit further to make sure that it's not some kind of neurological problem that's going on, or maybe a metabolic problem, like a high blood glucose. Speech, then we go to content of arousal, and then to the arousal itself, and then finally down to systolic blood pressure. Use this five-point quick neuro check, and it'll help you to be able to find neuro problems early before they become a big problem for your patient. Thanks for joining me for the Neuro Quick Check. My name is David Woodruff. Until next time, bye now.